Well, welcome. This is Optometric Education Consultants uh, webinar series. It's my great uh, opportunity to uh, welcome Dr. Nate Lighthizer to our, to our panel and to our program. He's a graduate of Pacific University College of Optometry. Upon graduation, he completed a residency and family practice of optometry with an emphasis on ocular disease through Northeastern State University's Oklahoma College of Optometry. He has since joined the faculty uh, at the College of Optometry in Oklahoma and serves as chief especially care clinician and chief elective diagnostic clinic. In 2014, he founded and now heads the dry eye clinic at the College of Optometry. He was also at that time named director of continuing education as well as assistant dean for clinical care and services at the Oklahoma College of Optometry. Starting in 2020, he was named associate dean of NSU Oklahoma College of Optometry. He's a founding member and currently serves as president of the Intrepid Eye Society, which is a group of emerging thought leaders in optometry. He is also named a member of PECOM's 250, a list of the top 250 optometrists in the country. He lectures nationally on numerous topics, most notably advanced ophthalmic procedures, electrodiagnostics, and ocular disease. So with that, please give a great virtual <laughs> welcome to Dr. Nate Lighthizer. Nate, take it away. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate the introduction. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Vanessa, for having me on. It's my pleasure uh, to be here. I want to say good evening to everybody. I'm glad you're here. We're going to have some fun over the next oh, 100 minutes or so uh, for this lecture on diabetes, new testing and treatment uh, for retinopathy. Again, I, I think OEC, they do just such a great job on CE. Greg, again, Joe and Vanessa. And again, I really appreciate the invite uh, and just good, good friends, good colleagues. Uh, and again, just enjoy being here. So again, like he said, Nate Lighthizer, I'm a faculty member at the Oklahoma College of Optometry in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. I've been there for 12 years now, hard to believe, uh, 12 years down here in Oklahoma, uh, where I serve in various roles, uh, as Joe said. So again, diabetes, new testing and treatment for retinopathy. There's my disclosures right there. Well, again, we'll keep this within the guidelines of a COPE approved lecture, as you can see right there. As Greg said, if you've been to my lectures before, you know I love to poll the audience. I think it's a great way to ask you guys, what do you think this diagnosis is? How would you treat this patient? And, and nobody likes to raise their hand when we're in person. It's even harder, obviously, virtually here as well to get that feedback back and forth. But what I like about this is we can do this virtually. You're sitting in your living room. I'm sitting here uh, in my living room as well. And we can ask and poll the audience here via the poll everywhere. So everybody grab your phone or grab a, your iPad or just open up another browser on the computer that you're watching this. And if you open up a browser and you type in pollev.com forward slash Nate Lighthizer, pollev.com forward slash Nate Lighthizer, that will bring up my poll everywhere page. And again, nobody likes to raise their hand or offer their input, especially when we're virtual. This is a completely anonymous way to poll the audience. Nobody will know what you put. I won't even know what you put when it comes to poll everywhere. So no individual answers. But what's nice with this is it tells you what percentage you put A versus B versus C versus D versus E. So you can kind of see how the group as a whole is thinking and compared against your answer. And again, nobody will know your answer except you. So pollev.com forward slash Nate Lighthizer, that will bring up my poll everywhere page. And I always introduce a little intro question right at the start here, kind of a, a light kickoff question. I'm a big sports fan. You see in the background of Greg, he's got his Steelers memorabilia in the background, a big Steeler fan from Pennsylvania. I was born and raised in North Dakota, as many of you maybe maybe know. You can hear that North Dakota, Minnesota accent, don't you know? Yeah, yeah, sure, you betcha. So I'm a Minnesota Viking fan. So I usually ask a sports-related question, but this time I'm going to do a little bit different. I was in Kentucky lecturing a couple of weeks ago, and somebody came up at the start of my lectures, said, Nate, I know you love to poll the audience. You should poll what percent of the doctors out there have had their COVID vaccination. It'd be interesting to see. I thought, okay, that'd be interesting. I did that in Kentucky. I did that at SECO. So let's do it again here with our poll everywhere. Have you received your COVID vaccination? Again, no right or wrong answer in regards to this question here tonight. It's completely anonymous. Have you received your COVID vaccination? Yes, I have. No, I have not. Again, completely anonymous with this one. But again, what's cool to see, we've already had 23 responses. 
you guys can see all you have to do is hit the button. Very simple, very straightforward, very easy when it comes to this. And after you guys hit your button, I hit a button on here and you can see, there you go. You can see the group is general. 83% have, 17% have not. That's how we're going to do the polling question throughout the course of the next hour and a half, hour and 35 minutes as well. So again, P-O-L-L-E-V dot com forward slash Nate Lighthizer. There's the poll everywhere page and every question will have that address uh, as well. So I always like to show some pictures of my kids to start. My uh, There's Addie and Camden. They are nine and six. So this picture's a couple of years ago, uh, as you can see this picture right here. Here's another great picture of them. I thought I made a great Mickey. What do you guys think? I'm down in that Mickey costume really well. Obviously, I'm just joking on that one. Uh, that was at Disney World pre-COVID uh, before we had to halt those live meetings, at least for a little bit that have now started up uh, just again there. Born and raised in North Dakota. There's an appealing photo for all of you right there. You can see the snow, the, the, much, the feet and feet of snow that we get in North Dakota. My parents and all my loved ones still live there as well. And last picture I'm going to show you. Again, I always like to start it uh, a little light as we get on to this two-hour presentation. You guys get a lot of CE everywhere. You support the OAC and Greg and, and Joe, and they do such a great job. Your state associations, the national meetings, you get CE a lot of places. You can go on golf trips, you can go on cruises, et cetera, et cetera. I was asked to lecture at a unique meeting uh, a couple of years ago. It was a group of optometrists from Minnesota and Wisconsin that have to get CE and they love to fish, you know, any fishermen out there. And this group of optometrists, about 15, 20, 25 of them, every year they go up to a lake in Ontario and they fish all day long, all day long they fish. And then they come in for dinner and some beverages in the evening. And the speaker does 12 hours of CE over the course of about four or five evenings. I did like two or three hours a night. So it was a fun CE fishing trip. I'd never heard of a fishing trip CE. Well, I got invited to do that. I spoke there and I got to catch this thing right here. Anybody know what that is? Let's type it in via the chat box. I got I got the, the polling open. I should say the chat box open in the bottom right. What is that? What am I showing you in this picture right here? What do you think? And look at that. Number one nails it right there. A muskie. Yeah, that's a 42 inch. It's a fish. I like that. Dr. Richard, it is a fish and some pine trees. Thanks, Greg, on that one. Love that. Some pine trees. Beautiful Ontario there. That's a 42 inch muskie. I uh, actually got to go back a couple of years later, took my dad with me and we caught a, or he caught a 47 inch muskie as well. So just thought it was some, some unique pictures, some fun pictures to start out with uh, right there. All right, on to business. We're going to talk about diabetes, new testing, new treatment for retinopathy. We're going to talk about ERGs. We're going to talk about OCTs. We're going to talk about uh, OCT and geography uh, right there as well. Just laughing at the chat box right there. Um, ERGs, new testing and new treatment. I'm going to challenge you guys this evening, like I challenged myself two, three, four years ago, is, is there more that we can do for diabetes and diabetic retinopathy? I always start this saying, I'm guilty. You say, you're guilty of what, Nate? I'm guilty of watching and waiting. Don't we do that kind of in diabetes and diabetic retinopathy? We wait, we watch, we watch and we wait. We wait for structural changes. We wait for signs of diabetic retinopathy, whether they're cotton wool spots or microaneurysms or hemorrhages, whatever they are. We wait and we wait and we watch and we watch until we see changes and then we inter intervene afterwards. Is there a more proactive approach that we can utilize, something more that we can do for our patients with diabetes and diabetic retinopathy. We're gonna talk about that tonight. That's gonna to be more of the new treatment for retinopathy, kind of nutritional supplementation. We'll talk about that as we go forward. So new testing, new treatment for retinopathy, and then we're gonna really spend the last 45 minutes or so, nothing but clinical cases, case after case after case, when it comes to diabetes, other conditions as well, when it comes to electrodiagnostics, ERGs, OCT angiography, et cetera, et cetera. So let's start with some ERGs. You know, what do you think of when you think of electrophysiology? I always, I always make the joke when I'm live. You guys remember that room in the back at school? It was kind of dark in there, wasn't it? That department, that, that room way in the back, there was no windows in this room because maybe patients had the dark adapt and there was wires everywhere. You never really wanted to go back into this room where the ERGs were because you can wires everywhere. You don't want to get zapped with all these wires. And who knows if you walked into that room 
where would those electrodes get attached? You know, maybe you're going to look like this after a little bit, and maybe we're reading minds and all. My point is, is electrophysiology that looks like this or looks like this. Here's a picture off of the internet. I got this. this is probably from 50, 40, 50, 60 years ago. Electrophysiology, ERGs and VEPs and EOGs. When you look them like this, this is the ERGs of 25, 30, 30 years ago. Technology evolves and advances, whether it's in the dry eye space, whether it's in OCTs, retina, glaucoma, whatever it is, we have new technology adapting. And whereas the technology here that was not overly doctor friendly and not overly patient friendly and not overly staff friendly, and maybe this testing took 30 minutes. When I took over as a, in our electrophysiology department at the College of Optometry 11 years ago now, we used to sit patients, and we still do occasionally, but for almost all patients, we used to sit them in the dark for 30 to 40 minutes. They had to dark adapt. They were dilating. We put contact lens electrodes on their eyes. And while that's good testing, it wasn't the most doctor-friendly, staff-friendly, and most importantly, patient-friendly as well. As this technology has evolved, and advanced, you know, we have, we now have ERG systems that are laptop, or they're even handheld devices that will flash lights in the eye. They hold this little paddle right over their eye, flash, 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 flash for 25 seconds, and flash, 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 flash for 25 seconds as well. And we've got flash ERGs in less than 30 seconds in each eye. So much quicker, much more doctor, patient, staff friendly, as we've talked about as well. So let's talk about the ERG and diabetic retinopathy. I bet it's not a test that you think of a whole lot when it comes to diabetes and diabetic retinopathy. So let's ask our first question. Your patient that you're going to see tomorrow morning, your mild NPDR patient without macular edema, most often has a visual acuity of what? Let's assume no cataract, no ocular surface issues. You've got a patient with mild retinopathy, maybe even some, it's moderate retinopathy. They've got no macular edema. They, they've got no cataract lens issues. Most often they have a visual acuity of what? 2020, 2030, 2040, 2050. What are your thoughts on this one? Again, it's probably a patient you'll see tomorrow. A patient with diabetes got minimal to no or mild retinopathy. What is their visual acuity most likely going to be uh, for this case right here? And I bet we're going to be very close to unanimous. Uh, in this question right here. We'll see what your answers are uh, in just a second here. Let me move the chat box down. And your answers, we are unanimous. We all know the answer. They're 2020. My point is, is visual acuity is not a great indicator for how your diabetic patient is doing. They may have microaneurysms. They may have cotton wool spots. They may have uh, extrafoveal exudates. They may even have extrafoveal macular edema. And yet their vision remains very strong at 2025, 20, 2020, 20, or even better as well. So my point is, is visual acuity is not a great indicator of how your diabetic patient is functioning. And again, function, I think, is important uh, in this case right here. So let's talk about di diabetes. Before we get into another question, before we get into diabetes, I want to ask you guys via the chat box. Again, via the chat box, let's have some interaction back and forth. What are the most common ancillary testing that you guys do for your patients with diabetes and diabetic retinopathy? Let's type it in via the chat box. Most common ancillary testing that you guys do for your patients with diabetes and diabetic retinopathy. What are they? You guys do your eye exams, obviously. We got There we go. We got OCT. We've got OCT as well. What a OCT, OCT, OCT. We've got four OCTs. What else? Most common ancillary tests that you guys do for your patients with diabetes and diabetic retinopathy. We've got OCT on the board. We got OCT angiography. We've got fundus photos as well. So we got a couple of photos and photos, and all of you do DFEs as well. We have fundus photos and OCTs are certainly going to be the two of the most common. So if you think about it, you do a dilated fundus exam. You take maybe fundus photos and you do an OCT or an OCT angiography. That is structure, structure, structure. Three structural tests with the fundus photos, the DFE, and the OCT. That is all structure. What about function? We do structure and function so very, very well in other conditions like glaucoma. So maybe we should look at both structure and function. When we're doing an ERG, I, was, I explain this to every single patient 
when we are doing electrophysiology testing or new testing, you know, we're getting ready, we're cleaning their forehead and we're scrubbing their lower eyelids to remove the, the makeup, the oils, the debris, dead skin cells, things like that. I always take that opportunity. Have your technician take the opportunity going, do you know why we're here today? Or do you know what we're doing? Oh, this is a new test doc. I always tell them this. Have you ever heard of an EKG before? And it's amazing how all patients, they've heard of an EKG. They know what an EKG is. They've either had one or, yeah, I know what an EKG is. Most of them say, yeah, I've had an EKG before, or they at least know what they are. I said, that EKG, they hooked up electrodes to your chest, and it tells you, how's the heart firing? How's the heart functioning? Basically, how is your ticker working? How's that heart functioning overall? And hopefully things come back two thumbs up and everything is functioning well. But if it's not... Maybe they can intervene, change something. Maybe it's the follow-up schedule. Maybe it's a tweak of medication, something like that. They can change something so we can prevent major structural change from happening like that heart attack or that myocardial infarction. That's how I explain that to patients going that, you know, the EKG for your heart, this is the exact same thing for the back of the eye. This is the EKG for the back of the eye. It's called an ERG. We're going to hook up some electrodes to your lower eyelids to the forehead as well. We're going to flash some lights in your eyes. And it's basically going to tell me, how's your retina firing? How's it functioning? Basically, how is your retina working? I can see the structure. I'm going to look at the back of the eye. We're going to dilate your eyes. We're going to probably take some photos. We may do a special test called an OCT. All of that does a beautiful job of looking at the structure of the back of the eye. This is going to pair with it nicely to look at structure and function, just like they do with the heart, just like we do with glaucoma, other conditions as well. And patients seem to get that. So have your technician, or if you guys are involved with this yourself, but I bet it's your technician, tell them this is the EKG of the back of the eyes. It's going to give us an idea of how well your retina is functioning. And it's very, very useful in diabetes and diabetic retinopathy. You guys manage diabetes. Do you guys see diabetic retinopathy? And the answer is yes. I bet it's getting more and more common as our population is aging. We are the primary medical eye care providers across the country. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. As ophthalmology numbers really are static or maybe even slightly declining, the population is booming, it's aging, and we are being forced to manage more glaucoma, more macular degeneration, more cataracts, more post-surgical care, and more diabetic retinopathy as well. So we're only going to see more and more of this as time goes by. You can see the numbers right there, 30 million Americans uh, have diabetes. That number is expected to almost double uh, over the course of the next 10 years, really nine years now. So more and more of this pre-diabetes, uh, seventh leading cause of death, and it's probably underreported to some degree as well. If your patient was just diagnosed with diabetes and they come in for their baseline exam, their first exam since being a diabetic, I've had patients say, doc, you know, I was just diagnosed with diabetes and I know this can affect the kidneys. I know this can affect the heart. I know this can affect the, the fingers and the toes. We've all had a patient or two or a loved one or somebody we know that's had a toe amputated or a foot amputated or, you know, from diabetes. Doc, I know it can affect all of those other things, but I also know it can affect the eyes. What's the likelihood that this affects my eyes? The diabetic retinopathy, generally speaking, it's about 35%. But we all know that, if, that it depends on multiple different variables. So I want to ask you again via the chat box, what are the factors that you see in your practice that are most likely to determine whether or not a patient develops diabetic retinopathy? What are those factors that, help, that lead patients to develop diabetic retinopathy? What do you think? Via the chat box, let's interact back and forth again, what factors play a role in determining whether or not a patient will develop diabetic retinopathy? What do you guys think? Your diabetic patients, what, what is most likely? Yeah, I like that there. A1C, how long they've had the diabetes, A1C, length of disease, sugar control, smoker, so comorbidity factors, elevated A1C, blood sugar control, weight, there's more comorbidities, whether it's weight, obesity, smoking, um, a lot of different things with that, but I think a lot of you guys have already mentioned this. It's going to be duration of the disease. It's going to be type one versus type two. And certainly it's going to be their control as well. Somebody that's got tight sugar control, tight A1C control, going to be much less likely to develop retinopathy versus somebody that has their A1C and their sugars fluctuating all over the place. But we also know that duration of disease certainly is going to play a role. Again, very quickly, answer via the chat box for me. Which diabetic are you, generally speaking, are you more concerned about? 
Is it the 25 year diabetic or the three year diabetic? Which diabetic are you more concerned about? Generally speaking, the 25 year diabetic or the two year diabetic. And I'm guessing most of us, and we got 25, 25, 20, most of us would probably say the 25 year diabetic. Now it's, it depends on multiple variables. Maybe the three year diabetic is living in denial and is not ready to control their diabetes just yet. But generally speaking, I think we're going to be more concerned about the 25-year diabetic than the three-year diabetic. And it drives home the point of duration of disease plays a role. Type of diabetes plays a role, and certainly their blood sugar control as well. We know that one in 13 patients has proliferative retinopathy. And if they have proliferative retinopathy, they had non-proliferative before that, mild, moderate, severe, non-proliferative. Again, are you guilty of watching and waiting like I was guilty and still am guilty of watching and waiting in certain instances? Is there more that we can do, better recommendations that we can do as well? One in 13 patients has went through all the stages and got to proliferative retinopathy. And we know patients are more likely to have other comorbidities seen in the eyes as well. So there's your severity disease. I always like this table. It's a, it's a new slide I put in a, a few lectures ago. And it's from the American Academy of Ophthalmology, their preferred practice pattern. Just a lot of different, a lot of information on this table. It's from 2019. And I like this because it gives you a lot of information, gives you the different stages of diabetic retinopathy from normal or minimal NPDR to mild, to moderate, to severe. Now we're in proliferative, both non-high risk and high risk. And it gives you how often should you really follow these patients up? That's this column right here. You know, is laser indicated? Is grid indicated? Is injections indicated? All of us are our optometrists on this call. I bet we all agree which half of this table do we usually see patients with diabetes? Is it the top half of the table or is it the bottom half of the table? And the answer is it's the top half. You have many more patients that have no retinopathy or mild retinopathy or moderate retinopathy, then you do have severe non-proliferative, non-high-risk proliferative, and high-risk proliferative. We see many more patients in the first half of the disease compared to the second half of the disease as optometrists. Now, if you're a retina specialist, now maybe you're dealing with more PDR and severe macular edema and things like that. But as an optometrist, I think all of us probably agree we're in the first half of the disease. And how often do you usually see those patients back? One year, one year, six to 12 months or basically one year, unless they develop macular edema. But for most of the first half of the disease, we're going to see them back, see in a year, or maybe it's see in six months for moderate NPDR, but even there, you could go back, see you in a year for those patients. So when we're changing things, maybe the patient's got an abnormal ERG. Maybe we are starting them on nutritional supplementation, as we'll get into in just a little bit. Maybe you want to change that follow-up schedule. Instead of seeing them every 12 months, maybe you see them in six. Instead of seeing them in nine months, maybe you see them in six. If you see them in six months, maybe you see them in four months. So remember that follow-up schedule, and maybe you tweak that based on your abnormal ERG or your abnormal OCTA or whatever testing that you are using uh, as you're managing your patients with diabetes and diabetic retinopathy. So we'll come back to this, to this table uh, in just a little bit. Let's talk about the Flickr ERG, the flash ERG. The first word is important. Flash ERG, the first word is telling you what's the stimulus. In this case, it's a flash of light, hence a flash ERG. Patients hold this little mini Gonsfeld, this little paddle right over their right eye and then right over their left eye. Again, 25 seconds over here, 25 seconds over here as well. The reason I always spend a couple of seconds talking about flash ERGs versus pattern ERGs is it's very important to determine what areas of the retina are they testing. You guys are looking at your phone, your iPad, your computer, um, you're, while watching this presentation, you're looking at your computer and the image of your computer is falling on your central retina. You can see your walls and your ceiling and your floor in your side vision in the periphery. But when you're looking at a computer screen, the image on that computer screen is falling on your central retina. So if you're doing a pattern ERG or a multifocal ERG where the pattern is on a computer screen, and it's rotating back and forth or rotating all around, when you're looking at a computer screen to do an ERG, it's a test of central retinal function. Central retinal function for the pattern ERG and the, the uh, multifocal ERG. This is different. Now we've got a flash ERG. If I flash a light in your eyes, boom, 
I go boom right there and the light goes up and down and left and right. It flashes everywhere. A flash of light is going to diffusely illuminate the entire retina. Again, from top to bottom to left to right, that flash ERG. So when you're doing a flicker or flash ERG, do know that it diffusely illuminates the entire retina, the overall retina, and therefore, this is a test of overall retinal function, global retinal function. It's not going to pay attention to small retinal lesions. This is not going to be the test of choice, the flash ERG, to pick up early plaquenil toxicity or hydroxychloroquine toxicity. That would be the OCT or the fundusatal fluorescence or the multifocal ERG, which looks at central retinal functioning. This is a global test. And because it tests everything, the entire retina from top to bottom, left to right, it's not going to pick up those small retinal lesions uh, because it's an overall retinal test. So remember that with the flash ERG and what condition do we want to know overall How's the retina doing? It's usually retinal vascular disease, whether it's diabetic retinopathy, artery occlusions, vein occlusions, ocular ischemic syndrome, et cetera, et cetera with that. So a global test of overall retinal function, that is your flash ERG. Why is that? Boom, because it's a flash of light, which goes up, down, left, right. It diffusely illuminates the entire eyeball, the entire retina with that flash flicker stimulus here. So uh, let's, it drives home the point of this. We talked about this already. Visual acuity is not a great indicator of overall how's your diabetic patient functioning of the overall retina because best corrected visual acuity is really tied to that central two or three degrees. You already, already answered this. Your diabetic that's got mild to moderate retinopathy that might have some hemorrhages and some cotton wool spots and some, some MAs, what's their visual acuity? It's likely 2020. You guys already answered that. So best corrective visual acuity is really tied to that central two or three degrees. And this case helped to drive home that point. And you take a look at this. This is a 53-year-old female that was sent into our practice for special testing, OCTs, ERGs, to figure out what's causing these extensive macular changes in this 53-year-old female. Guess what her visual acuity was in this 53-year-old female? Guess what she was? 2020. Why was this patient 2020? Because her central two to three degrees remains strong, fortunately remained intact in this 53-year-old female. So this has nothing to do with diabetes, nothing to do with diabetic retinopathy, but that was an interesting case when you look at this. Doesn't this kind of look like bullseye maculopathy, kind of plaquenil toxicity? It's kind of arching around the macula. It's not hitting the dead center. It's kind of bullseye macula. But this doc would have obviously picked up if this patient was on plaquenil, hydroxychloroquine, or chloroquine. Patient had never taken any of those. So then you got to ask yourself, what's causing this bullseye-like maculopathy, this geographic atrophy in the back of both eyes? Um, and, and you take a look at this and you know, it's like we ran ERGs. Guess what? The flash ERG was completely normal. Flash ERG was completely normal, which tells you this is not an overall retinal disease. Maybe it's limited to more of a macular disease uh, in this case. So we ran different testing and ultimately the ERG came back normal in this case. Uh, so we've got some sort of maculopathy in this case. Fortunately, this patient has been hanging on to 2020 for quite some time uh, in this case, but it drives home the fact that the that best corrective visual acuity is really tied to the central two or three degrees here. OCT does a fabulous job of this. That 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 structural area of about 12 degrees there sometimes can go beyond that, but a fabulous job of this multifocal ERG does a great job of saying, how's this spot functioning? And how's this spot functioning? And how's that spot functioning? And how's that spot functioning as well? Does a great job, <clears throat> excuse me, of telling of central retinal function. The flash ERG goes from top to bottom, left to right, the entire retina. Overall, how's that retina functioning? Uh, that's what the Flickr ERG tests right there. So again, what does it look like? This is what it looks like for these patients as they get that flash ERG in their eyes here. Here's our indications. And again, by far the biggest piece of the pie, the biggest piece of the puzzle for these patients is going to be diabetes and diabetic retinopathy. Probably 80 to 90% of the flash ERGs that we do are for diabetes and diabetic retinopathy. We pair it with OCT. We pair it with OCT and geography. We pair it with our DFE fundus photos as well. We've got structure. We've got function as well. How is our diabetic and their retinopathy 
Is there, uh, is there dysfunction? Is the retina pretty functional? And again, it helps us to give us an idea of prognosis along with their other testing. So by far the number one indication, diabetes and diabetic retinopathy. But don't forget about the more rare stuff whether it's the retinal dystrophies, rod cone dystrophies, cone dystrophies. How often do you have patients that come in with color vision issues or peripheral vision issues or nighttime vision issues? Maybe they're light sensitive. Is it a cone dystrophy? Things like that. Unexplained decreased vision. I bet you guys do OCTs you know, fairly regularly where patients have unexplained decreased vision and we're trying to figure out why structure and function, and we're trying to figure out why with those cases. So diabetes is certainly the biggest piece of the puzzle, probably 80 to 90% in our clinic, but there's other reasons why we may reach for the flash uh, ERG as well, again, in diabetic retinopathy. Look at the literature. There's more and more literature on the role of, of electrophysiology in the diagnosis and follow-up of diabetic retinopathy. In this case, you can see here, uh, in, in addition, both the ERG and the VEP have proven to be successful tools for the early diagnosis of the disease and for ophthalmologic follow-up of diabetic patients. And again, we hit on this already, the early diagnosis of the disease. We're not using this, or you could use it for treatment purposes, for following treatment, but as an optometrist, by the time your patient gets proliferative retinopathy, high-risk PDR, they're going to be likely in the hands of an ophthalmologist, a retina specialist. This is a great test in the early half of the disease for the earlier diagnosis and follow-up of diabetic retinopathy patients. You see another one here. Most studies show unequivocally that the different types of ERGs detect local abnormalities. That would be the pattern ERG or the multifocal ERG. Again, local abnormalities, central dysfunction because they're pattern tests. Patients looking at a computer screen, pattern ERG, multifocal ERG, or widespread pathology. That's going to be your flash ERG because it's an overall global retinal test, even in very early stages of the disease there. Electrodiagnostics 2.0, again, get newer and newer information coming out on diabetes, flash ERGs, diabetic retinopathy as well. Assessment of early retinal changes in diabetes using a new ERG protocol, and you can see their conclusion there. Uh, the new st uh, stimulation protocol reveals early changes in retinal function in diabetic patients. Screening using diabetic retinopathy, using a new dilation-free full field flicker ERG recording device. Again, more and more literature coming out on ERGs and diabetic retinopathy. I thought this was a very interesting one. You guys are the second group that gets to see this article or uh, what I presented uh, this article. The first was at SECO. You guys are the second one right here. Enhancing risk assessment in patients with diabetic retinopathy by combining measures of retinal function and structure. That's structure function, function structure when we're comparing our OCTs, our fundus photos, our DFE, now with ERG. So this is looking with, uh, at structure and function. And here's what they found. I thought this is very interesting. Patients were identified as having structural abnormalities and needed intervention in that percentage. Okay, You can see here 19% at one year, 31% at two years, 53% at three years. Again, they had just structural abnormalities. If they just had structural issues, that's the percentage that they needed intervention in this study. All right. If we added structural abnormalities, plus they had functional abnormalities. So the photo was abnormal, the OCT was abnormal, but we've also added an abnormal ERG as well. What did that do to the, the patients that needed intervention? And obviously when they've got both abnormal, now we're much more likely to have intervention over the one, two, three year follow up. But let's change the game now. Structural abnormalities, but function was normal in these patients. And take a look at this. Now we know that the percentages go way down. I mean, we've got a good prognostic indicator when function was normal, the chances of intervention went from one out of five or one out of three when it came to uh, structural abnormalities plus function abnormalities. It went from 34% down to 3% when you change that function from being abnormal to that function being normal there. At two years, 54%. Versus 4% did increase a little bit at year three on that one. But you'll notice that pairing structure and function gives you a nice idea, a better idea of how well is this patient going to do a year from now, two years from now, three years from now. So remember to pair, again, enhance your risk assessment, combining measures of retinal function and structure when it comes to your patients with diabetic retinopathy. I thought that was interesting data uh, that came out very recently uh, in that paper there. How about comparing this to our classic test? 
for testing how much retinal ischemia is there? How much how much non-perfusion is there? How much capillary dropout is there? Our, our standard historic test has been fluorescein angiogram. And this study, again, it's been around for a long time. So looking at older versions of ERG showing that the ERG is just as good, if not even better than the best test that we have for detecting neovascularization, ischemia, capillary dropout, et cetera, uh, et cetera. Obviously we have OCT angiography is now, which we'll talk about uh, in just a few minutes there. So the flicker or flash ERG is a great predictor of ischemia as well. So there's our indications uh, as you can see right there. Electrodes. I told you this is kind of when I take that opportunity to, to tell the patient, this is the EKG of the back of the eye, the EKG, the visual system, or really the back of the eye, the retina, as we're cleaning the forehead, as we're cleaning the lower electrodes and attaching the forehead electrode, the lower eyelid electrode, the lower eyelid electrode as well. That's when I explain the test to the patient. Lots of different electrodes that you can use. I've used all four of these electrodes. I do like the lower eyelid electrodes as there's much less patient put, uh, pushback versus when you're having a wire dropped across the eye or a gold foil tucked in the canthus, or these are the Burian Allen electrodes that we use occasionally as well that have great signal. Don't get me wrong. These electrodes in the top left have great signal because they're going right on the surface of the eye, but a little bit more pushback when it comes to patients when you're putting these Burian Allen electrodes in. The lower eyelid electrodes, they work very, very well. A nice balance between patient acceptance, patient compliance, and still fairly strong signal strength as well. All right, let's go through the printout. And you take a look at the printout here, and this is a fixed luminance FFERG or flash ERG, meaning single brightness, fixed luminance throughout this test. And let's go through this printout very quickly. First thing, signal quality. I want a nice signal quality. The greens, the yellows, the reds. Obviously, we want to be in the green, meaning we've got good signal quality as we're hooking up those electrodes. Right eye over here, left eye over here. This is your raw data, your, your qualitative waveform. What I want to see is two sinusoidal waves the bigger, the better, the more robust, the better when it comes to this data right here. This looks very, very good. But qualitative data is fine, but don't you guys want quantitative data? I want numbers. I want compared to a reference database. So this is nice, but give me some numbers. And the numbers corresponding to this qualitative data are the magnitude, the amplitude, the strength of the response of the retina. And you can see this top row in this table here, this magnitude, it's about 12 in the right eye, about 13 in the left eye, and that's right in the middle of the normal ranges. Here's the normal range for this testing device, somewhere between 8 and 22. So if you're taking notes, that's what you want to remember is somewhere between 8 and 22 is our normal magnitude. Obviously, the bigger, the better, the more robust, the stronger, the bigger the number, the more strong the retina response, which is a good prospect, good signal for that retina there. So somewhere between eight and 22, 12 is better than eight. 16 is better than 12. The bigger the number, the better. Just as important, if not more important, is this what's called mag phase plot right here. This is a representation of the strength of the response, but also the consistency of the response, the repeatability of the response, and the speed of the response as well. Over the course of 25 seconds, there's over 600 data points uh, in this little plot. There's over 600 little lines right there. And the more consistent they are, the closer they are to one another, the tighter the wedge in that bottom right quadrant, the more normal. That represents a consistent fast, speedy response here. This is where I always make the analogy to a golfer, okay? If you've ever golfed with Greg Caldwell, he's a stud golfer, okay? He's a scratch golfer, okay? And I'm a 25 handicap golfer. So if we go golfing, what's Greg gonna do? He's gonna stripe one down the middle, down the middle, down the middle, down the middle. Every, he's a healthy golfer. And yeah, occasionally there may be one to the right or the left, but most of them are right down the middle. A healthy retina, is going to go normal, 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 normal. Yeah, there may be a stray abnormal one here or there, but normal, normal, normal. And you're going to see a tight wedge in the bottom right quadrant. That is very normal. As things start to become dysfunctional, as they become abnormal, as the retina is becoming ischemic and not responding to that flash of light as it should, what happens is that tight wedge in the bottom right quadrant starts to shift. Whoops, I hit the wrong button. 
it starts to shift. Notice these responses are scattering everywhere. This retina is not handling that flash of light like it should. And you take a look at this, we'll call again, Greg's the scratch golfer. I'm the 25 handicap golfer. And you'll notice I'm spraying it everywhere, right, left, even a 25 handicap golfer might stripe one down the middle, down the middle, and the next one's going to the right or the left in the bunker. Normal, abnormal, 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 normal, abnormal, normal, abnormal. Ab they're all over the place. So what happens between Greg, the normal golfer, my analogy to the healthy retina, as you can see here, healthy retina, consistent, speedy, strong response versus now look what happens. Our magnitudes have fallen. We are scattered across all these different quadrants. The response is slowing down. It's not responding like it should. And notice it's not consistent whatsoever. This is the unhealthy golfer or the unhealthy retina in real life in this case right here. So again, that's very, very important to look at. I take a look at that all the time of how consistent is this retinal response. You know, the saying goes, even a blind squirrel can find an acorn every once in a while, even a sick retina can respond normally every once in a while, but over the course of 25, 30 seconds, when you have over 600 data points, you start to get some abnormalities. This is the multi-luminance test. So I actually do two ERGs. I do the fixed luminance, which is a single brightness, hence a fixed luminance, flash, 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 flash for 25 seconds. And I do this over here for 25 seconds. And then I do a multi-luminance, which goes from dim to brighter, 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 brighter over the course of 30 seconds. So I actually do two tests in each eye, 30 seconds over here and 30 seconds over here as the brightness steps higher and higher and higher. And what you wanna see is a very healthy area under the curve. Great area under the curve, as you can see here with a long line moving into the bottom right quadrant. Again, a speedy, strong, consistent response. That is very normal. Let me show you abnormal. It's one of the most abnormal responses that I've ever seen. If we have time, I will get through this case uh, a little bit later here, but notice there is no area under this curve. This retina is incredibly weak. There is barely any response here, and we have no lines moving into the bottom right quadrant. Very, very abnormal retina right there. And obviously, following these over time, just like glaucoma function, visual fields, you guys do OCTs yearly. Same thing with the ERGs of how is our trend looking over time as well. So what do we do about it? We've got all this great testing. We've got OCT that we didn't have 20 years ago. We got OCT angiography that we didn't have 10 years ago. We got ERG now that we didn't have 10 years ago as well. What do we do about it? Is this going to change anything? It's a question that I asked myself when we were implementing this about three years ago, a little over three years ago now, is what is this going to change? Well, if your doctor told you, doc, you've got an abnormal EKG, abnormal EKG, ah, whatever, you're fine. We're not going to change anything. Your EKG is abnormal, but I'll see you back in a year for your next routine physical. You would never accept that. You would never be okay with that. And the same thing here as well. If we've got abnormal ERGs, if we've got abnormal OCT angiographies, I'm guessing you probably are not going to say, eh, we'll see them in a year and we'll change nothing. Sure, you're going to change things. Maybe you start the patient on an eye supplement. Maybe you change the follow-up schedule. Instead of seeing them back in 12 months, Maybe you see him back in six. Instead of seeing him back in six months, maybe you see him back in four. You know, change that follow-up schedule. See them more closely. Maybe you start them on a medication like an eye supplement. <coughs> Excuse me. Maybe you perform other testing. Maybe it's an OCT angiography, a visual field, better, more patient education. Maybe more communication with their PCP. That's 7.5 A1C. That's kind of borderline, not great, but you know, maybe we let it slide in some. And it's not so great if they've got an abnormal ERG or capillary dropout with OCT angiography. Maybe it's an early referral or save a referral as well. I think it's really these top four. You maybe recommend nutritional supplementation, change the follow-up schedule. Maybe you do additional testing or better or more patient education as well. And we'll come back to this in just a little bit. So I'm going to talk about nutritional supplementation and diabetes and diabetic retinopathy. Now, again, this is one supplement on here, but for fair balance, I want to mention multiple of them. This is I Promises Diabetes Vision Support, Science Based Health makes a product called Neurontin. Um, physician recommended nutraceuticals makes it. There's multiple different areas. Look into nutritional supplementation for your diabetes and your diabetic retinopathy patients. I would encourage you guys to look at this study. 
This is a fabulous study. This is the Diabetes Visual Function Supplement Study, the DIVFA study. It's about six years old now. And it was by Paul Chaus, Stu Richer, and Jeff Gerson, three of the biggest names in our profession in medical retina. Three optometrists as the lead authors, and this was published in the British Journal of Ophthalmology. I think it's a big deal. The British Journal of Ophthalmology, this was published by these three optometrists, uh, as you can see here. Here's what they did. This was a six-month study. And this is so much easier to describe when we're in person, because I always do this. I say, all right, this half of the room, you guys over here, you all have diabetes. No retinopathy or mild retinopathy or moderate retinopathy. The patients that we as optometrists, we own, we manage. You guys over here, no retinopathy, mild retinopathy or moderate retinopathy. You guys are going to get a supplement for six months, nutritional supplement, in this case, the, the DVS. You guys over here, you guys also have diabetes, no retinopathy, mild retinopathy, moderate retinopathy. Again, that those patients that we see quite often, you guys are going to get placebo. You're basically going to get nothing uh, for these six months. And we're going to do this study again. Baseline is the same between the two groups. And let's measure a bunch of different things. Let's measure visual acuity, but we obviously know what visual acuity is going to be in these patients. It's going to be 2020. You guys already answered that question. That's why I asked it first right out of the gates, but let's measure other things. Let's measure contrast sensitivity. Let's measure color vision. Let's measure macular pigment scores. Let's measure some systemic markers like lipids, inflammation, um, diabetic peripheral neuropathy scores, etc. A lot of different, let's, let's see how this patient is functioning. Let's look at structure as well. So it was a six month double blind placebo controlled trial, as we talked about there. And they looked at pre and post analysis of a lot of stuff down there. And I'll, I'll break it down for you. Here's what they looked at in this div fuss study. They looked at contrast sensitivity. They looked at macular pigment scores. They looked at color vision. Again, did they look at visual acuity? Certainly they looked at visual acuity, but other means of looking at function. Let's look at macular perimetry, those central points. How sensitive are they at detecting those central points on the visual field? Nerve fiber layer thickness, OCT of the macula as well. Let's look at some systemic markers, A1C, lipids, vitamin D3 levels, inflammatory markers like C-reactive protein, tumor necrosis factor. And let's look at diabetic peripheral neuropathy symptom score. Basically a survey of how are you feeling in your fingers and toes, your peripheral neuropathy symptoms. How does that do after six months of a supplement versus six months of placebo for the other half of the study there? So six month um, randomized, double blind <clears throat> placebo controlled trial uh, in this study right here. There's the characteristics. Again, not a huge end number. Would like to see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of patients, but not a big end number when it comes to this. Um, but there was no statistically significant difference in the baseline characteristics between the supplemented group and the placebo group. What's the, what, what are the findings? Well, you take a look at this slide. It's obviously a lot going on on this slide. So let me explain this for you and kind of break it down the different tests that we already talked about, the different things that they looked at, not all of them, but most of the things they looked at right here, the supplement values, the placebo values, the difference between the two, and then obviously the p-value. A p-value less than 0.05 is significant. I say that again, a p-value less than 0.05 is significant. And here's what was statistically significant after six months of the study in favor of the supplement. You can see color vision improved. I didn't put it on here, but contrast sensitivity improved as well. The central points on the visual field, that 5-2 mean, devi uh, mean deviation in the visual field, that improved as well. Macular pigment scores improved. Systemic markers improved, whether it was the lipids, the triglycerides, the C-reactive. Now, are we as optometrists, are we treating lipid levels and triglycerides and C-reactive proteins? Yeah, the answer is no but it's a nice unintended benefit as well. Diabetic peripheral neuropathy scores improved as well. A lot of things improved after just six months of a supplement there. So summary of effects, you know, who should consider taking DVS? This is something that I've grappled with. I've battled with over the last two, three, three and a half years. Certainly it's not for everybody. There is not a pill that's for everybody. There is not a drop, a glaucoma drop that is for everybody or a dry eye drop that's for everybody. So you can't just say, oh, you should put all your diabetic patients on nutritional supplementation. 
But here's what I've kind of come to the conclusion. They have any degree of retinopathy or an abnormal ERG. I really need to add that in there. Any degree of diabetic retinopathy, an abnormal ERG, or an abnormal OCT angiogram, in my mind, they're showing some changes and I make a recommendation. So any degree of retinopathy or an abnormal ERG or an abnormal OCT angiogram, we make a recommendation. If they got reduced visual function or low macular pigment, if you do MPOD testing, they have any degree of, you know, doc, I'm just not seeing as quite, quite as well as I used to see doc or they're 2025 20, minus. You just can't quite get them as well as you thought you could. We make a recommendation. If they've got uncontrolled diabetes, those sugars are out of whack. They're going left, right, up, down. They're all over the place. We make, make a recommendation if their A1C or their blood sugars are out of whack or the longer that they've had the diabetes. As you guys all identified earlier, the duration of the disease certainly plays a role in how likely they're going to develop diabetic retinopathy. So if they've had it for quite some time, we make a recommendation as well. So those are the four. Now of the four, the weakest one's probably the bottom because I've seen diabetic patients that had diabetes for 10 years, 12 years, 14 years. Their A1C was controlled. They were 2015 sharp. They were well controlled. Like I said, they have no retinopathy and we didn't make a recommendation. But you're going to see plenty of patients that have had diabetes for a number of years and their A1C is 8.1. Uh, and they're 20, 25 minus, and maybe they've got mild retinopathy, I would encourage you to think about, again, read that study of the DVS. Go back here a couple of slides. You know, the diabetes visual function supplement study. Dive into the study, really read it for yourself and, and get the points, the take-home points for yourself. And I think you're going to come up with one of the conclusions of, man, you know, I th think when I have diabetic patients that meet one of these criteria, maybe we should recommend nutritional supplementation. This is not new. We are all well-versed on nutritional supplementation and what other retinal condition, AMD, AREDS, AREDS2. We've all been well-versed on nutritional supplementation for the back of the eye. Again, nu nutritional supplementation, whether again, it's DVS, science-based health product, uh, physician recommended nutrition. There's lots of different products. Encourage you to look into nutritional supplementation for your patient with diabetes and diabetic retinopathy. Another article on the beneficial effects of nutritional supplements on the development of diabetic retinopathy here. I always mention this and I forgot to go back. If this is something that interests you, send me an email. Paul Chow, so I know Greg and Joe know, know Paul. He is one of the most, if not the most knowledgeable individual I've ever come across when it comes to diabetes and diabetic retinopathy. Just a phenomenal individual. Great lecture, lectures nationally, just like Greg and, and Joe do all the time as well. Do a phenomenal job. And Paul, I remember meeting him for the first time. I was attending a lecture of his at a dinner lecture, and he put up a picture of a retina. And it was one of the most lasered retinas I had ever seen. I mean, it, there was laser everywhere. And I remember him talking about this, and then at the end of the presentation, he said, and that was my retina. Um, Paul was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when he was five years old, so like 50 years ago. So it hits home for him. He's he, he's went through the stages of not really controlling it like he should and therefore having to get uh, um, getting proliferative retinopathy, having to get laser early in life. That was his retina with laser everywhere. Incredibly knowledgeable. If you want to dive into this and kind of looking at all the, the ingredients that may be healthy for retinal vasculature and this or one of the other supplements, send me an email. Paul uh, has typed up a document that's about 12 pages long that has a paragraph or two on each of these ingredients and why they're healthy for vasculature, why they're healthy for the retina. You know, why is vitamin C healthy and vitamin D and vitamin E and vitamin B12 and, and fish oil and alpha lipoic acid and, and this proprietary blend that contains benfotiamine and, and acetyl L-cysteine and grapeseed extract and resveratrol. All of you have heard of resveratrol before in red wine. It's why we all drink red wine, correct? For the health benefits of red wine. But send me an email and it, di it dives into the weeds on why all of these are healthy for retinal vasculature, the retina vasculature in general. So again, it's just a great article. There's a hundred references in that. It's incredibly well referenced. When you, I've got that document. Again, it's from Paul Chaus and he's gave, given me permission to send that on uh, if you so desire of looking at it and diving into the weeds on why nutritional supplementation is important for your diabetic patients there. So there's our indications.
And we've talked about the different indications. Diabetes is the number one, and it does. It affects decision-making that we do as we've talked about already there. So very quickly, I want to talk for just a couple of minutes. Uh, we're going to deviate off of glaucoma for like five, or excuse me, off of diabetes for like five minutes because I wanted to introduce, you know, at your guys' you know, advanced meeting here uh, of evaluating flash ERG changes associated with glaucoma. And we've been doing this recently as well, that same flash ERG when flashed in a different way looks at something called a photopic negative response which is looking at the functionality of the ganglion cells and again we do structure function so very very well in glaucoma we've got visual fields we've got OCTs we've got fundus photos your DFE so we do structure and function the problem with glaucoma is our functional test the visual field, it's subjective. How many of you guys do visual fields? You all do visual fields and we need to do visual fields. You guys ever done a visual field and you regretted doing the visual field once you got the results back? We've all been there before. So it's nice to have an additional functional test, which we started doing this in about the last year, year and a half uh, of the photopic negative response. The same test, flash ERG, flash, 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 flash for 25 seconds in each eye. And the third wave, again, I'm diving into the weeds here, the photopic negative response tests the functionality of the ganglion cells. How many of you guys do ganglion cell analysis, ganglion cell complex on your glaucoma? I'm guessing many of you do OCTs and you get ganglion cell analysis. That's looking at the structure of the ganglion cells. This is looking at the function of the ganglion cells, the photopic negative response or the function of the ganglion cells right there. Again, A wave, B wave, the C wave is also known as the photopic negative response, functionality or dysfunction of the ganglion cells as you can see right there. Again, same setup, same, you know, as we talked about already though, that forehead, lower eyelid electrodes, 25 seconds, and that is our flash ERG uh, right there. So I wanna talk about the photopic negative response, healthy range is about 75, 76 milliseconds. So the quicker, the better. So in this case, a lower number is better when it comes to the photopic negative response. You can see these numbers that are 71, 72, 73, 74 milliseconds. That signal is boom. It's going quickly. That retina, those ganglion cells are handling that flash of light. They're handling it quickly. That's a healthy response versus outside that normal range, greater than 80 milliseconds and higher that is a slowed response, a delayed response when it comes to that photopic negative response that you see uh, right there. Again, we're utilizing this in diabetes, uh, di excuse me, in glaucoma, different cases here. When you look at this on the left, uh, a very, very normal one. We've got artificial intelligence within limits, within limits, the MVA index, very, very close to one, which is very good. This number goes from zero to one, the closer to one, the better. And that looks absolutely great versus ones that are outside the normal limits as well. So newer testing that we are utilizing in our glaucoma patients and pairing it with visual fields and OCTs and fundus photos and our pressures, et cetera, et cetera, on that one. Healthy case, normal case, you can see that very, very good. And the response is normal here as well. Mild glaucoma, we've got some changes, some, some mild changes here on this one. And the photopic negative response is abnormal. And in this case, we've got mild to moderate defects, some changes uh, in both eyes there and the photopic negative response as well. And lastly, a severe glaucoma case. Again, I told you I was gonna go through this very quickly because we're talking about diabetes, but I wanted to introduce the, the photopic negative response. It is a component of the flash ERG. When it's flashed in a different way, it tests ganglion cell function or ganglion cell dysfunction uh, when it comes to that. All right, so let's get into our coding and billing here. VEP code 95930, test the entire visual pathway. Flash Flicker ERG 92273. This is the code that we've been talking about. The test that we've been talking about this entire time is 92273, the Flash Flicker ERG. That's the code right there. And multifocal ERG is 92274, as you can see right there. All right. You guys got through the boring stuff. You got through all the background, all the, 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 the history of this, the different tests. These last really 40 minutes, we're going to spend on nothing but cases here. All right. Case number one is a 63-year-old female. And this patient was sent into our clinic for special testing. She was a diabetic patient. Well, 
How long have you had diabetes? 20 to 30 year diabetic. She said, I've had diabetes for at least 20 years. I don't think it's been 30 years. So somewhere between 20 and 30 years, diabetic patient, hypertensive, hyperlipidemia. I took a screenshot of the medications, as you can see here, lots of different medications. This is a very common medication list for the patients that we see here. If you're affiliated with our college or you have been around our college of optometry or you're familiar with it, I should say, you know, we see Cherokee Nation. So we see a high prevalence of vascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, you can see all these different medications that this patient is on here. We're not on insulin. And despite all of these different medications, our last A1C is 11.0. So certainly maybe that best corrected vision of 2050, the reason why this patient was sent in is going, why can't we get this patient better than 2050? You know, best corrected to 2050. Well, maybe it's the diabetes at 11.0. Here's the back of the right eye. I'll give you a couple of seconds to take a look at this. Back of the right eye here. Take a look at the nerve because I'm going to bleach out the nerve on the next slide to get the retina brighter. This is an artifact here, artifact here, artifact here as well. So we've got a couple of artifacts there. Overall, let me bleach this out here. Nerve looks pretty good. Nerve looks good. I'm not seeing any, any evidence of any, any disease on the nerve. All right, let's bleach the nerve out give you a better picture of the retina. Overall, for a 20 to 30 year diabetic with an A1C of 11.0, this actually looks what? Type it in via the chat box. Give me some feedback here, back and forth. Some feedback via the chat box. For a 20 to 30 year diabetic with an A1C of 11.0, this retina actually looks what? What do you think? All right, you got a yeah, it looks, looks pretty good, doesn't it? Good, good, looks pretty good, good, good. Yeah, it looks kind of pretty good for a 20 to 30 year diabetic with an, and yeah, not that bad is what I would call it. It doesn't look bad. We've got some, again, maybe it, it's an artifact there. Artifact, you know, is that a little bit of a cotton wool spot or is that just the nerve fiber layer there? Maybe a little cotton wool spot here as well. I call this mild NPDR in the right eye. There's a blown up view as you can see right here. That doesn't look too bad for a 20 to 30 year diabetic with an A1C of 11.0. Let's flip to the left eye. Again, here's, this is an artifact right here. This is an artifact right here as well. Remember we're best corrected to 2050 in both eyes. Best corrected to 2050 in both eyes. Okay, artifact here, artifact here. Give you a couple of seconds to take a look at this left eye. blown up picture of the left eye coming right there. Okay. And again, a pretty similar picture to the right eye. Again, I call this mild NPDR is what I call this. It didn't appear that we had any macular edema based on looking at this photo, looking at the similar photo in the right eye. And guess what? OCT confirmed that. We're looking at the OCT here. <clears throat> Just based on this OCT gang, if you're just looking at this OCT and only at this OCT, you would expect visual acuity to be what? Type it in via the chat box. What do you think? Visual acuity you would expect based on this OCT would be what? 20, here's the retina maps, 2020, 2020, 20, you know, 2025, 2025. I would agree. It would be 2025 or better in this case. Certainly looks pretty good. Outer retina, photoreceptor integrity line looks pretty good as well. I would say this is a nice, healthy appearing structural retina in the back of both eyes right here. So I'm going to ask you, what do you think is responsible for this patient's 2050 vision? Is it the ocular surface? Is it the lens? Is it the retina? Is it something neuro related? Maybe this patient is malingering. She should be seeing better. We've all had patients that we could find nothing wrong. You did every test in the front of the eye, the back of the eye, you did visual fields, you did OCTs, you took photos, you looked at the back, everything looked good. You did MRIs, everything looked, you go, I can't figure out why this patient's 2060 or 2040 or 2080 or whatever it is. What do you think is responsible for this patient's reduced? Maybe this patient is just one of those that just can't see better for whatever reason. Polling is open. Let's take a look via the poll. Everybody's doing it in the chat, which I like that as well. We got we got B, 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 lens, A, B, D. You know, so I will tell you, 
obviously we're going to look at the lens. Obviously we're going to look at the ocular surface. I will tell you, it's not lenticular. Uh, well, you guys are obviously going to evaluate that. We evaluate. It's one of the first things we looked at uh, is what's, and I love the, this is why I love the polling is you look and you go, wow, we're spread across the board here. I looked at the ocular surface. I looked at the lens and went, I don't think the ocular surface and the lens are responsible. Maybe I need to rule out something neuro in this case, actually did a visual field and it came back with scattered defects that were non-neurological in nature. She had, she had no neurological defects whatsoever. But again, she was sent in for OCT and ERG testing as well. Here was this patient's ERG. Let me show you this patient's ERG right here. Okay, this is the pattern ERG, which by the way, we didn't go over the pattern ERG, but you guys know what it tests because we covered that central retinal function. So even though the central retina structure looks pretty good, central retinal structure looks pretty good. Central retinal function didn't look great. Not looking so hot when it comes to this. Here's the test that we covered in depth. Our ERGs, fixed luminance on the left, multi-luminance on the right here. Again, <clears throat> these are flash ERGs or FF ERGs, flash ERGs in both eyes. And via the chat box, is this normal or abnormal? What do you think? Normal, abnormal via the chat box. Is our retina functional? Is it dysfunctional? And you take a look at this and sure enough, all right, the qualitative looks kind of reduced. Remember what these two sinusoidal waves going like this? That certainly looks reduced. The magnitude, what did I give you the normal range as? Somewhere between th uh, eight and 22. Somewhere between eight and 22 with the bigger the number, the better. And this patient is at 3.8 in the right eye and 5.4 in the left eye. And if this retina was a golfer, they golf like me, the 25 handicap golfer, and not like Greg, the scratch. Look at, we're scattered everywhere. This retina is not firing in a consistent, repeatable, speedy manner. It's slow. It's inconsistent. It's not handling that flash, 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 flash over the course of 25. So this is an abnormal ERG. This retina is dysfunctional. How about the multiluminance? Look at this area under the curve. Certainly, this is reduced as well. So what are we going to do about it? Certainly we could have sent this patient to neuro, but I don't think this is neurological related. The visual field said, no, the, the ERG said this retina is dysfunctional. And here's what I tell patients now. And I bet you guys do the same thing when it comes to diabetics. I always tell them that whether it's structural changes, whether it's OCT changes, whether it's ERG changes, you are going down a road that you and I don't want you to go down. There's a cliff at the end of this road. And at the, when you go off the cliff, it's very hard to get your vision back. We want to stop this or at least slow it before you get to the edge of the cliff. You're hurtling towards the edge of that cliff quickly. And your ERG is saying, we're looking at a retina attack, a retina attack. Just like I tell patients sometimes, you know, if your EKG was very, very abnormal and things are not functioning well, are you looking at a heart attack? Same thing here, or similar thing here of, this retina is not looking good. We've got some ischemia here. We've got some dysfunction here as well. And I said, I want to throw this in reverse, but it's going to take both of us to do this. It's going to take your doctor and myself and you buying in as well. We've got a retina that's saying, I am not well. I am sick. If you go back to when do we consider nutritional supplementation? They've been a longstanding diabetic. Check. Uncontrolled diabetes, A1C11. Check. Vision's not as good as we think. Check. Any degree of diabetic retinopathy or an abnormal ERG, check, check. We've got like every single reason to recommend nutritional supplementation in this case. And that's what we did. Now, I always say, okay, you can tell your patient to take science-based health, physician-recommended nutrit nutraceuticals, I promise, whichever supplement you want to recommend. But if they continue to eat three bowls of cinnamon toast crunch in the morning and then have Olive Garden for, for lunch and then have a bunch of carbs and a large Dr. Pepper for dinner, that nutritional supplement is not going to do anything. So it's a, it's a balanced approach of, is it smoking? Is it losing? Is it not smoking? I should say, is it losing weight? Is it exercise? Is it controlling your diet? Getting, it's a lot of different things. And I'm happy to, this is one of the, the patients that I'm most proud of is she took hold of this. She's 63 years old. And she said, you know what? I want to see when I'm 83. And I said, I do too. I want you to see when you're 83 as well. She goes, we're going to throw this in reverse. I said, that's awesome but it's going to take hard work. It's going to take time to be able to do this. We started her nutritional supplement. 
She worked on her diet. She worked on weight loss. She worked on exercise. She worked on all of that. And her ERG in six months went from this to that. And it's not, it's not normal. It's still not in the normal range, but we are showing a functional improvement with her retina, which I was very proud of her to be able to see this. So your ERG is saying we are moving in the right direction. Now, was it the nutritional supplement? Was it the A1C that went from 11 to in the nines? It was like 9.1, 9.2. So our A1C went down. Was it that? I think it's probably both. So our A1C improved. Her visual acuity went from 2050 to 2010. I'm kidding. Totally joking on that. No chance it went to 2010, but it went from 2050 to 2030 minus. 2030 minus, some, so our vision's getting better objectively. She said, you know what? I think I'm seeing better as well. So her vision's getting better subjectively as well. So visual acuity is getting better. ERG is getting better. A1C is getting better. We are moving where we want to do in this patient, which was very, very exciting uh, in this patient. So remember the role of electrophysiology in this patient. Remember the nutritional supplementation. Highly encourage you to read the DIVFUS study uh, when, by Paul Chaus, among others. And remember the beneficial effects of nutritional supplements there. All right. I'm going to tie these next three cases together. Case numbers two, three, and four. 54-year-old Native American female. She was pre-diabetic. So she's not a diabetic. We're not diabetic like the last patient. We are pre-diabetic, but we've got a family history of diabetes, and we've got some systemic symptoms that make us suspicious of diabetes a little bit as well. But again, we are not diabetic at this point in time. She was sent in because you, my vision is just not quite as good as it once was. Left eyes, I was just a little bit worse. And sure enough, we're 2025 plus minus. So not terrible. We're not 2050 like the last patient where the vision was down by four lines. Vision's down a line, line and a half, a little bit worse than the left eye compared to the right, pre-diabetic. And you'll notice the medications. You'll notice the systemic history. Sjogren's, lupus, Crohn's, hypothyroid, hypertensive, or pre-diabetic. We've already had cataract surgery. Okay, I've already had cataract surgery. Anterior segments, unremarkable. Here's the back of the right eye. Let you take a look at that for a couple of seconds while I get a sip of water. Back of the right eye and the back of the... We're not going to see any signs of diabetic retinopathy. We're not diabetic at this point. Back of the left eye. Back of the right eye, back of the left eye. Overall it looks pretty good. Nerve looks good. Vessels don't look too bad. Macula looks pretty good. No signs of any hemorrhages, anything in the back of the eye. OCT. I'll give you a couple of seconds to look at these retina map OCTs here. Looks good for the most part. All right, and it's time to introduce OCT. Oops, not yet. One more slide. There's our retina map right here. There's our 21 line raster right here. Again, you're going to say, what does the visual acuity look like here? You go, I probably expect that's 2020 or 2025 based on these OCTs here. But let's introduce OCT angiography. When you take a look at OCT angiography here, I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes, a minute or two on OCT angiography. It's something that we've, we've had in our practice for hard to believe almost five years now with OCT angiography. These top four pictures at the top going left to right, these different slabs or slices from the superficial retina to the deeper retina, to the outer retina, RPE, to the choriocapillaris. This is on FOSS imaging. It's like you're looking straight on at the retina, but peeling away layer by layer by layer by layer as you go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. Again, from the superficial capillary plexus to the deeper capillary plexus to the outer retina, RPE, avascular, to the choriocapillaris. This is all fine and dandy. These nice pictures here, they look good. They're the qualitative data. And I remember practicing with this for the first year, year and a half or so. It's like, this is cool. But I've got to have some numbers eventually. Give me some numbers, some comparison to a reference database, because we all like numbers. Imagine if you practiced with uh, an OCT without any numbers on your retinal nerve fiber layer analysis. It would be helpful, but it wouldn't be as helpful as it is to have numbers, comparison to a reference database, et cetera, et cetera. So this is all fine and dandy. 
But this bottom left plot is what I want to look at here. And it, it, this is the density of the capillaries, the capillary network. And this is the color scale here. The thicker, the better. I like to see it in the greens and into the yellows and maybe even to, to the, the oranges if we could get there as well. That looks great. As the capillaries are dying out, as they're, they're starting to have capillary dropout, you're going to notice we're going to get into the blues and even the more blues and even the colder blues as we have capillary dropout. And you can see spots of capillary dropout in this patient here. So that certainly is concerning here. I want to take a step back. Overall, when you look at these four on FOSS images, the two on the left are for diabetes, retinal vascular disease, et cetera. That, that's the two scans that I look for in diabetes and retinal vascular disease. The two scans on the right, generally speaking, we're looking for abnormal blood vessels in AMD, histoplasmosis, pathologic myopia, among other conditions as well. Uh, but we're looking for abnormal development of choroidal neovascular membranes. Maybe it's an atypical central serous choreal retinopathy or something like that. So the two on the left are retinal vascular disease, in this case, diabetes. The two on the right, generally speaking, are your AMD, your outer retinal conditions right there. And again, for diabetes, I'm looking at this bottom left plot and we're seeing capillary dropout, not only in the right eye, but also in the left eye as well. So that's concerning to me. You take a look at the ERG. Here's a normal example. Again, not this patient, one of our optometry students, healthy as a horse, retina is young, retina is strong. And whoo, look at that. That looks awesome right there. Again, this is an optometry student just showing you a very healthy normal. Here's this patient's. And you take a look and you'll notice, obviously one eye is worse than the other. The left eye is worse than the right. And you can see we've got magnitudes outside the normal range. And again, this isn't a pre-diabetic. We're not diabetic, we're pre-diabetic at this point. Right eye is not terrible. I would call this low normal borderline. We've got a pretty tight wedge in the bottom right quadrant. Notice the left eye swinging outside that bottom right quadrant. It's starting to there. And the multi-luminance, there's the normal example. And notice that area under the curve there reduced as well. Lines not moving as much as we'd like to in that bottom right quadrant, especially with that left eye. So here's my interpretation. Low end of normal, borderline right eye, worse than that in the left eye. I would expect better results in a patient with a healthy retina. Wouldn't you expect better results in a patient with a healthy retina? Going, man, this is it's not great retinal responses there. That was my recommendation. I said, let's communicate with the PCP. We've got a family history of diabetes. She's got some systemic symptoms that are making me suspicious of diabetes as well. And guess what her A1C is? Is she pre-diabetic anymore? Nope. She is a diabetic patient at this point in time. So again, I'm going to compare all the case number two, which we just finished, case number three, and case number four in just a second. We have a newly diagnosed diabetic patient, A1C 8.4. Fortunately, with a clean retina at this point. Retina looks good when it comes to structure back of the right eye, back of the left eye as well. OCTs look pretty good, but it's our newer testing, the OCT angiogram and the ERGs that don't look great in this newly diagnosed diabetic here. How about case number three? Case number three is a 48 year old Caucasian male is in for his annual diabetic exam. No problems, no concerns. He thinks he's doing very, very well. At least that's what he thinks at this point in time. Diabetes type two, 16 years. Hey, he's, he's well controlled as well. A1C 6.6. So we're doing good there. At least we think uh, at this point in time, VA 2020. So we had a, a lot of good measurements here. We're 2020. A1C is in the sixes. Patient thinks he's doing well at this point in time. There's the back of the right eye. Give you a couple of seconds to take a look at that. Back of the right eye and the back of the left eye. Looks pretty good. Looks pretty good with this 16-year uh, this diabetic. OCTs. And OCT. Again, looks pretty good overall when you take a look at these two retina map OCTs. There's the left eye. There's the right eye. I'm not seeing any evidence of any major thickening here. No major thinning uh, in this one. Let's get an OCT angiogram. Here's the OCT angiogram in this patient. 
give you a couple of seconds to take a look at the OCT angiogram. And again, I want you to compare case two, case three, and case four. This is case three. We just covered case two, the newly diagnosed diabetic. And you take a look and notice the difference in this patient's OCT angiogram versus the last patient's. Does this OCT angiogram look better or worse than the last patient? Via the chat box, let's have some interaction again, back and forth. OCT angiogram, better or worse than case number two? And again, you take a look at this nice, this capillary network here. We're better, better, better. Oh yeah, much more plush, thicker capillary network here. Looks much, much better in this 16-year diabetic. Left eye looks overall pretty good as well. So OCT angiogram looks better. How about the ERG? You ready? Here's this patient's ERG. And I will tell you my jaw dropped when I saw this. At the time, it set the record for the strongest ERG response I had ever seen in a diabetic. It has since been beaten. All records are meant to be broken, right? Uh, it's now number two. We have a second year, di uh, excuse me, we have a second year optometry student that's a type one diabetic that I did ERGs on and she broke this record. She was actually in the 24s for her magnitude here. He's at 23.97 and 23.74. What did I tell you the normal ranges are? Eight to 22, eight to 22. And this, he, he knocked this out of the park. This is a grand slam with this ERG test. He did phenomenal. Look at that phase, that mag phase, a tight wedge, long wedge in the bottom right quadrant. Area under the curve looks fantastic. This is just an awesome, awesome ERG there. So the ERG and the OCT angiogram matched perfectly. So I'm going to ask you, which diabetic are you more concerned about? The newly diagnosed diabetic or the 16-year diabetic? Which diabetic do you need to follow more closely? Maybe recommend nutritional supplementation. Maybe see back in four to six months. Which diabetic are you more concerned about when you look at the OCT angiograms and the ERGs? And absolutely, it's case number two. It's the newly diagnosed. So utilize this new data, the OCT angiograms, the ERGs as well. And it doesn't mean I'm going to say to case number three, you're good. See you in 20 years. We're certainly not going to do that. But you can rest assured. I told this patient, I'm going, boy, you are looking good at this point. You're doing pretty well. Your A1C6, his vision is good. He was happy. And I am happy as well with these ERGs on the right side. I said, boy, you're looking good. The chances of you developing diabetic retinopathy are, are where we want them to be right now because your ERG is looking phenomenal. It's, look, it's like if you had an EKG and the EKG came back as strong and normal as possible, your e ERG came back as strong and as normal as possible. This is phenomenal. So I'm more concerned about, and I'm going to watch more slowly, well, more slowly, more closely, that case number two patient, the newly diagnosed patient. Guess which one I put on nutritional supplementation? Case number two. She was, she had really no retinopathy. She's pre-diabetic, but she's got abnormal ERGs and she's going down a road that I really don't want her to go down. Guess what? Case number three, 16 year diabetic. So that qualified, but he had no retinopathy, normal ERGs, good A1C, vision was good. We did not recommend nutritional supplementation in case number three there. All right. How about case number four? Last one I'm going to tie together. 77 year old male. I told you I'm going to tie case two, case three and case number four together. So this is the third of our three cases tied together. 77-year-old male, one of my favorite patients. He came in, I've seen him multiple times, like three, four, five times over the last two years. Great guy. And he comes in, just, just a great 77-year-old retired gentleman. And he's had diabetes for a number of years, 19 years, last A1C, 8.2. He's going, well, it's not great. I'd like it to be 6.2, not 8.2, but he's doing, he's doing okay. And he said, yeah, my vision is a little bit down in the left eye. I just can't quite see as well in that left eye over the last year or two. So he had a left eye concern, left eye complaint when it comes to the visual acuity there. So an A1C, 19-year diabetic. There's the back of the eye. <clears throat> back of the right eye. And the back of the left eye. You look co closer, there's a couple of small MAs when you look at both eyes. There, go back to the right eye, you know, one little spot here. Back of the right eye, back of the left eye. Again, in this 2020 minus 2030-ish in the left eye patient, 77-year-old diabetic. All right, there's the OCT. 
OCT here. Take a look at the OCT right eye. Looks pretty good. OCT left eye. Looks pretty good. OCT angiogram. I'll give you a couple of seconds to take a look at this OCT angiogram. Right eye and left eye, right eye and left eye. And you take a look and, you know, where does this patient fall compared to the other two? And it's kind of, isn't it kind of right in the middle, isn't it? If you take a look, there's the newly diagnosed diabetic. There's the 16-year diabetic with that plush, thick, wonderful capillary network. And there's the 19-year diabetic, kind of in between the two. And guess what? The ERG was exactly the same as well. Here's this patient's ERG. And when you take a look at this, if you had to put this in the normal bucket or the abnormal bucket, which one would you put it in? Which one would I put it in? I, if you had to pick between normal and abnormal, I might lean normal here, but thankfully we don't have to do that in real clinical practice. This is kind of borderline. It's borderline, low normal, low normal borderline, maybe very mildly abnormal in the left eye. Notice the magnitudes, 10.5 and 8.9. It's in that normal range that I gave you between eight and 22, but you can just notice, especially in that left eye, our responses are starting to slow down just a little bit outside that bottom right quadrant. Here's the area under the curve. Again, it's not bad. It's probably low normal. It's in, maybe in the normal ranges, but notice the speed of that response. It's supposed to be long lines moving into the bottom right quadrant, and we're just not getting there just quite at, at this point in time. So again, these are not crazy abnormal. I probably would call them low normal borderline ERG responses there. But he was, you know, again, unsatisfied. He was not satisfied with that left eye, especially. He's a 19-year diabetic, okay? He's got some very mild retinopathy. All right, his A1C is 8.2. His vision's down a little bit, and we've got borderline ERG. So we've got like one, two, three, four, four or five different reasons to recommend nutritional supplementation in this patient. So I talked to him. I said, you know, you're you're going, you're slowly going down a road that me wait maybe don't want you to go on. You're not anywhere close to the cliff, but you said you'd like something done. And I said, well, this is what I think's going on. You've got some borderline ERGs. I would like to recommend some nutritional supplementation in this case. And he took me up on it and we talked about diet and we talked about exercise and we talked about, you know, he doesn't smoke. So we don't have to worry about that. But guess what? A 77 year old guy, you think he wanted to exercise a lot? No. Did, did, did his A1 change? No. His A1C did not change. Went from like 8.2 to 8.1 to 8.3. He was in the low eights. So it wasn't like his A1C went from 8.2 to 6.2. It was about the same. Okay. What's been cool to see is I saw him in the fall of 18. Then I saw him in the spring of 19, six months later. Because I bet most of you, if you go back to this photo, if I showed you these photos and said, yeah, you got a 19-year diabetic. Here's the back of his eye. Here's the A1C, or excuse me, the OCTs. Here's the OCT. When would you see this patient back? Most of you, I'm getting, I would have said the exact same thing. What is it, a year? I'll see you in a year. I'll see you in 12 months. I changed it to six months. I said, you know what? I want to see you back again in six months. Another opportunity to chat with you, say hello, take a look at your eyes. We'll educate you again, see how you're doing with that nutritional supplementation. How is the A1C doing? I'm going to see you back in six months just to see and check how you're doing. So I saw him in the fall of 18. I saw him in the spring of 19. I saw him in the fall of 19 as well. Again, what's been cool is seeing the role of electrophysiology and nutritional supplementation. Again, he used this for over, he's still using this nutritional supplementation to this day. Here's what his, his ERGs did over the course of the fall of 18 to the fall of 19. Again, fall of 18 to the fall of 19. It went from this to that. And it was, again, really cool to see. And by no means are you going to see this in every single patient. It's certainly not going to happen. But it was cool to see. And he was happy to see uh, that his ERG was improving. He subjectively felt like his vision was a little bit better as well. But you notice the magnitudes are a little bit better. Got a little bit more speedy of a response in these ERGs as well. Uh, as you can see here, his multiluminance, again, a little bit more area under the curve, maybe. But what I'm really looking at is that retina, is that it's kind of just firing better. You know, we're firing and a little bit more quicker with these lines in the bottom right quadrant. So certainly looking better as well. A1C didn't change. Vision, guess what? Went from 2030 minus, the, excuse me, 2030 plus to 2025 minus. 
So is there really any difference between 2030 minus two and 2025 plus two? Yeah, that's like one letter difference, but he was happy. So, you know what? I think I'm seeing a little bit better. He was happy about his ERGs. He was feeling better about himself. So I think it worked well in, in that case as well. So again, tie those three together, Remember, whether it's OCT and geography, it just fit the ERGs match perfectly with the OCT angiograms. And that's been my experience time and time again, who had the worst ERG, the newly diagnosed, who had the best ERG, the 16 year diabetic that knocked it out of the park and the 19 year diabetic was in the middle. So I think this newer testing, this newer treatment uh, that we have is really affording us more options um, and more things to offer our patients, more tools in the toolbox uh, when it comes to that. All right, I'm going to finish. Oh, I got about well, I think I got about 11 minutes left uh, on case number four, 50 year old female. It's one of my favorite cases here. This 50 year old female saw this patient a uh, few but years back. And this patient was on the schedule for punctal plugs. And at the college of optometry here, if somebody's on the schedule for punctal plugs, usually it's like I'm in the conference room and the resident will take care of it. Or the students, our fourth year students, they'll take care of it. The resident will check them out. I don't even see these patients. You know, yep, okay, we're dropping in some plugs. They referred in from one of our satellite clinics, whoop, dropped in the plugs. We're great. We're good. Uh, and, and send them on their way. But the, the resident was astute in this case, was knowledgeable, you know, was on top of it and noticed that, you know, I probably should pay attention to those visual acuities where they were 20, 20 in the right eye and 20, 40 in the left eye. All right. So we got 20, 40 in a diabetic patient, hypertensive, A1C is 8.9. Notice the blood pressure reading. So we've got some vascular disease, but vision is down in the left eye. And the resident came and got me, said, I did an OCT and there's the OCT. All right. We're going to be doing more than just punctal plugs today when we do an OCT and we have this here. And I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to vote via the chat box or via the poll everywhere. What's your diagnosis for the left eye? I just showed you an OCT. Is this diabetic macular edema? Is it hypertensive retinopathy? Is it macular hole? Or is it central serous chorioretinopathy? What's your diagnosis for the left eye in this one uh, right here? Again, this is a diabetic patient. We'll go back to the history here in just a little bit. Uh, we've got diabetes, we've got hypertensive, last A1C is 8.9. There's our blood pressure reading. Again, my vision's been down, Doc, when we asked some questions. Yeah, it'd been down maybe a week, two weeks, somewhere in there. There's the OCT. All right, and there's the OCT. And you can see the bubble uh, right there. We got the little bubble right there. So what is this? Let's see what you guys are thinking here via the uh, the responses. Okay, we've got central serous chorioretinopathy is what the poll everywhere is leaning. Probably the chat box was leaning more towards diabetic macular edema. Yeah, I would agree uh, with the poll everywhere here. This certainly looks like the classic OCT of central serous uh, choreal retinopathy here. So when we've got central serous choreal retinopathy, Greg, do you want me to shut this down? We're almost done here in our last eight or nine minutes. Uh, do you want me to close it and restart it? It's whatever you want to do. I would just, you know, st stop sharing and come back in. It'll erase all those blue marks for you. We'll do that. Stop sharing. And while you're doing that, Nate, I can tell every time you do this lecture, I sit as the third party chair for Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll probably have to be fixing uh, 92273 for some commercial insurance company that doesn't fix it, that doesn't pay for this yet. Yep. I, think we, I think we've got to fix with Medicare and Medicare Advantage, but then um, I can always tell when you lecture because uh, if someone from Pennsylvania is there, they want to know if the 92273 is covered. And then another thing while you're sharing your screen there and get everything back up and running is that these new tests that are out there, you know, I do OCT angiography. We have another functional test, you know, dark adaptation maculogics for earlier subclinical AMD. And now we're talking diabetic retinopathy here in a sense, but you know, you don't have that classic, you know, uh, cotton wool spots and microaneurysms and Irma and all that stuff. And you showed these cases of, of diabetic retinopathy, but they're not bleeding. And yes, I want the audience to realize that you can build that as diabetic retinopathy and you build that it using your, you know, your new, um, you know, ICD-10 codes and, you know, minimal or mild, whatever you feel comfortable billing with. 
And again, as the third party chair for Pennsylvania, um, when I talked to these third party payers, because I talked to them all the time, um, yeah, they just said, hey, look, if you got the scientific data there, you got the instrumentation there, they don't have to have that classic, you know, I call that macro changes. These are sure. micro changes uh, that we're seeing, and you can build those as diabetic retinopathy. Well, and Greg, I, I love hearing you say that, obviously, with your experience, your expertise on that, you know, I get the question quite often, okay, if I've got, if I can't see any retinopathy, but yet the ERG is coming back mildly abnormal, is that retinopathy? And I always say, classically, the answer is probably no, based on the, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, but that, that has changed now. That's, you know, like you said, macro versus micro changes, whether it's on the OCT angiogram, whether it's on the ERG as well. So I would tend to agree, I agree with you on that is I think you do have diabetic retinopathy when you've got abnormal ERGs or abnormal OCT angiograms. And it's good to hear that from the third party chair, uh, as you said that there as well. So again, I'm not necessarily saying this is diabetic related in this case, we've got central serous as you guys just diagnosed there in that uh, left eye. So we took a picture of the left eye. There's the central serous, as you can see it here. Let's now take a picture. Ah, we're taking a picture of the left eye. Let's take a picture of the right eye. All right. And I'll give you a couple of, this is the 2020 eye. I, I pretty much ignored this eye other than snapping a photo because the student took a, a photo of the left eye. We've got central serous. Uh, let's take a photo of the right eye as well. I'll give you a couple of seconds. Interesting findings here. We kind of blew over it on this day. 2020 in the right eye. What's your treatment for central serous. These days, Greg, what are, you, what are you guys doing for central serous in Pennsylvania? Now you you diagnose a case, pretty straightforward diagnosis of central serous. What are you gonna do with that, buddy? What do you, what do, you do with central serous nowadays? Yeah, I mean, if, uh, you know, one, I wanna check to see if they're on any type of systemic steroids, yep. um, if they're on, or any type of steroids, but systemic or orally. Obviously, if they are, then we wanna, you know, talk to whoever's has them on, or obviously don't discontinue them, let them know that, uh, Orals can do that. Uh, epilarion, how do I pronounce that right? Uh, epilarion, it's, uh, you know, it's an oral medication, pretty safe medication for the chronic patient. Um, if they're not on any oral steroids, then, you know, we'll just watch it and sit on it and, yeah. and, and see them back, you know, maybe in three to four weeks to see if it's settling down. That's exactly, I, I, we're gonna monitor most of these. Now, occasionally you can get an atypical central serous or a chronic one or something like that that may require some sort of treatment, but for the vast majority of these on the first presentation, we're gonna educate, we're gonna check for steroids, we're gonna monitor this. And usually I see them back in about four weeks. We'll see you back in a month for a vision check and an OCT. That's exactly what we did in this case here, but interesting findings in the non-central CRSI. Again, we're not seeing any problems. This is not this patient's macula, but it's a representation of what this patient's macula looked like. Interestingly enough, this, the, the pattern ERG looked abnormal in both eyes. One month later, again, just like Greg said, we're gonna see you back in a month, see how you're doing. There's the central serous in September. There it is in October. So again, it's going in the right direction. It's getting smaller from September to October. Nice picture of the back of the eye. I can still see that bubble there in the back of the macula, but we're moving in the right direction. There's the back of the right eye. And again, this is the 2020 eye in this case. Interesting. Better or worse than a month ago, guys? What do you think? Better or worse than it was a month ago via the chat box? Anybody? Better or worse? Any thoughts on this? We got worse. We got worse. We got worse. But this is not the central serous eye. Their, their vision's down in the other eye. So I'm kind of ignoring this at this point, even though it's worse, worse, worse. Shame on me uh, on this one, because you'll notice here was the photo from a month ago. And well, those hemorrhages weren't there a month ago, were they? And now they're here. But again, shame on me. Look at this mess of this mess of junk on the nasal side of the nerve, which some of you have called out already uh, via the chat box. Interestingly, what did I do? Again, shame on me. I said, I'll see you back in another month. We'll check that central series. We'll kind of watch this left eye in the back of my mind, but I should have paid more attention another month later. So we saw them in September, October. Now it's November. Central Cirrus in September and October. 
and November, Central Cirrus is doing what Central Cirrus often does, getting a little better and a little better as we go forward there. There's the back of this eye. Again, it's that bubble is gone. It's looking better. Whew, left eye is going good, but I bet you're more concerned about the right eye. Here's the right eye. Better or worse than it was a month ago. And we're going to go kind of around the world here in the different quadrants. Hey, you should have put those puncto plugs in, dude. I should have. Yeah, I should have, right? <laughs> so it gets worse. And okay, now should I, I can hear you guys through the computer going, pay attention to this eye, Nate. Stop ignoring this eye. And you're absolutely correct. Pattern ERG is getting better in the left eye. It's getting worse in the right eye. This is still, this is not this patient's OCT. The OCT, the macula still looks perfect. Looks great. There's no edema whatsoever. So I'm going to ask you, we know we have central serous in the left eye. What's going on in the right eye? Is this a retinal artery occlusion, a retinal vein occlusion, an ocular ischemic syndrome, or diabetic retinopathy? What do you think? Polling is open via the pole everywhere. What do you think is going on in this right eye? Retinal artery occlusion, retinal vein occlusion, ocular ischemic syndrome, or diabetic retinopathy? What do you think? Now, most everybody, you, most, most often nobody puts a, a retinal artery occlusion. It just doesn't really make sense with a retinal artery occlusion. Greg, I would argue it's probably not diabetic retinopathy because you would, why would it be so asymmetric? Now, not that there couldn't be a case like that, but you know, that amount of asymmetry, I don't know that it's diabetic retinopathy. Let's see what you guys are thinking. Usually it's, yeah, these two answers, ocular ischemic syndrome, number one, but don't forget about a vein occlusion, number two as well. So you take a look. Yeah, oh, hit the wrong button here. You go back here, oh, you look at this, look at those dilated, tortuous veins that you're seeing there. We've got a mess of crap here on the nasal side of the disc here. Uh, vision, again, is very close to 2020, 2025 minus, or excuse me, 2020 minus, 2025 plus uh, in this case here. We consider both B and C. This is a retinal vein occlusion, ocular ischemic, ischemic syndrome. I did send this uh, patient for a carotid scan. That was not my number one diagnosis. My number one was retinal vein occlusion. My number two is ocular ischemic syndrome. I did want to rule that out just in case. The carotid scans came back clean. They came back less than a 50% blockage. And I, I leaned on what I thought this was going to be. When you see these dilated, tortuous veins here, as you're seeing, this is an impending vein occlusion, a mild vein occlusion. I had an attending doctor call this venous stasis retinopathy, venous stasis retinopathy, an impending vein occlusion, a mild vein occlusion at this point in time. So this you know, is- Hold on, you know, Nate, that, that's actually a very old term, but it is a, a good term. Yep. Now, I, I, I think that, I think it still has validity. Yep. I think today we're calling it hypovolemic, uh, hypoperfusion retinopathy. Yep. As opposed to VSR. But clearly, I mean, you had some collateral vessels there. There's a thrombosis in the uh, in the in the in the vein, and you know the ocular ischemic syndrome. One thing I want to I want to stress, you know, or, or just mention to the audience is, you know, hypotony, hypotony, hypotony. If if that carotid is is really that sick, that eye is probably going to have truly single digit IL. Yep. And you're, you know, Joe, obviously is, as always spot on that. I, I always use that term because I'll never forget. It was about 15 years ago when I was a student, I was up and, and Joe, I think, you know, Leo Scorn, he's an ODDO, he's a neuro ophthalmologist. I spent three months with him and I remember him calling me in and it was a retina that looked just like this. I mean, looked exactly like this retina. It's not this one, but it looked just like this retina. I remember him asking me, what do you think this is? And I said, is this a resolved vein occlusion? I remember him saying it's an, it's a, an impending vein occlusion and he called it venous stasis retinopathy, which again, as you said, is an old term, but I like the terminology because it so nicely describes what's going on with that thrombus at the nerve. And we've had multiple people comment neo on the nerve. That is not neovascularization. It was not coming out at you. It was flat on the disc. Those are those collateral or shunt vessels on the disc there as the body is struggling to get blood 
um, out there with that thrombus, as Joe said as well. So and one, you- one thing, one thing I've noticed on, on those collateral vessels with CRVO, I don't, I don't have an anatomic explanation, but slightly superior nasal is where they usually come up. Yep. Number one, number two, inferior temporal. Yep. It's exactly, exactly my experience as well. So my last question as we are out of time is how would you manage this right eye? I think there's a lot of different answers to this. As an optometrist, when you have a, a vein occlusion that you are managing, you've got to look for the development of a couple of things. And one of them is obviously going to be the development of macular edema. You do your OCTs. Do they have macular edema? The other one is going to be the development of do they have any ischemia, neovascularization, et cetera, et cetera, with that. So do your OCTs and remember your ERG as well. And in this case, this patient had a very, very normal ERG. We can have ischemic vein occlusions. We can have non-ischemic vein occlusions as well. This one made us feel much better that the ERGs were actually looking very, very good uh, in this case, which is pointing us more down the road of a non-ischemic vein occlusion in this case. OCT made us feel good for macular edema. Um, Consult with the PCP, make sure the blood pressure is under control. It's absolutely correct. Could you send this to retina? You could, but Greg and Joe, what's the retina specialist going to do? If you send this patient to retina, you could do that, no problem. But what's the retina going to do about this? They're not going to do a whole lot at this point other than watch for macular edema and the development of any neovascularization. Actually, in my practice, they would laugh at me. Yeah. That, that's what they would do. Yeah. yeah. They, we can observe that just as well as they can, Nate. So yep. you that's are exactly correct. right. Yep. Look for, so I'm going to finish with this in my last 30 seconds. How did this patient do? Well, she no showed for a visit or two, which always makes you feel better. We want, I'm joking, obviously. This was her retina three months later. And you'll notice we are better than we were three months prior. When you go around the world, things are improving. Things are getting better. The ironic thing in this case is as the pattern ERG was getting better in the right eye, it got worse in the left eye. And this was the (laughs) left eye three months later. And we had recurrent central serous uh, in that left eye. So uh, again, watch those as Joe and Greg said, development of macular edema. You can use your ERG of, you know, how likely is this going to go bad, ischemic or not? In that case, it was a non-ischemic vein inclusion in that case. So with that, I am out of time. I want to thank, um, I think we, I'm looking for any questions here. I want to thank Greg and Joe. You guys are awesome. You run such a great, great team, great conference. Got to thank Vanessa for all the hard work behind the scenes. Um, I'm looking for any questions, not seeing any. Greg, Joe, any last thoughts? I think, I think this was a tremendous uh, breakdown and explanation uh, of this type of technology and in the role for it. You have a, a great understanding uh, of clinical pathophysiology. And I think that the, uh, that the audience really appreciated uh, what you had to say. And right now you're, you're beginning to get your virtual round of applause. You have a lot of people thanking you right now. Well, I appreciate being here and I guess we'll see you guys sometime in June for the next one. Yep. And that's what we're going to wrap up with here. So Nate, thank you very much. That was uh, diabetes mellitus, new testing and treatment for diabetic retinopathy. Nate, thank you as always. You know, it's great to see you. Hopefully see you live here uh, shortly, maybe at Vision Expo East as we were talking earlier. Uh, And thank you for, uh, for doing this for us tonight.